Tonight, I'll be sharing with us on what I title, Preparing for Marriage. Hallelujah. Amen. A married man was traveling in an aircraft and he was wearing his wedding ring on a wrong finger. And someone noticed and pointed his attention and said, Sir, you have your wedding ring on the wrong finger. And the man said, don't worry, it's because I married the wrong woman. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is not because he married the wrong woman, it is because he did not prepare for marriage. The marriage you don't prepare for will confuse you when you get there. It is preparation that determines your experience. People take time to prepare for everything. Some spend seven years in the university studying about rats and lizards. But when it comes to marriage, they think they don't have to do anything. All they need to do is to just find a partner and just march to the altar and be joined together. It is your preparation that determines your experience. You don't prepare in marriage, you prepare for marriage. You don't learn how to shoot gun in the battlefront, you learn to shoot it before the battle begins. As you make your bed, so you lie on it. There is no accidental fulfillment in marriage. If you are going to enjoy fulfillment in marriage, then you have to prepare yourself for marriage. And there is no better time to begin to prepare than now that you are single. I'd like to congratulate you because you are a single. <clears throat> And I'd like you to celebrate your season as a single. Being a single is not a disadvantage. Being a single is not a sin. You are not under a cause because you are a single. So many don't understand what it means to be a single, so they are in a hurry to get out of the single stage and get married. Life is in phases and men are in sizes. Every phase in life prepares you for the next one. And being a single is a necessary phase in life that should prepare you for marriage. You are not under a cause because you are a single. It's not a sin to be a single. It's a necessary phase you must pass through in the process of life. And I have good news for you. It's better to be a single, believing God to be married, than to be married and praying to become a single. So take time to enjoy yourself as a single. Celebrate being a single. There are so many things you can do as a single that you can't attempt to do as a married person. <clears throat> your time as a single is a very, very unique season of your life that God has given to you. And it is primarily for the purpose of preparation. Being a single should prepare you for marriage. Don't forget I said, you don't prepare in marriage, you prepare for marriage. So many people are having nasty experiences in marriage today, including Christian couples. 
Not because there's anything wrong with their partner, but because they never took time to prepare themselves. They thought marriage was all about just finding a partner. If I can just find the right partner, I mean, that's it. Tall, rich, and handsome. Holy Ghost filled and Naira loaded. But that's not all there is to marriage. Every successful marriage, every fulfilling marriage is a product of adequate preparation. And the best time to begin preparing is now. Somebody said, well, I'm not even thinking of getting married until maybe seven years to come. That's the more reason why you need to begin to prepare. If only you know how much you need to prepare, you will do everything within you to prepare now. Don't forget I said, you don't prepare in marriage, you prepare for marriage. If you wait until you get married before you begin to think of preparing, it will be too late. This is the best time to prepare. This is the best time to get ready. So many people have thought that all they needed was to just find a partner and just walk straight to the altar and get married. And then some have gotten married like that only to wake up. After some few days, the woman looked at the man and said, I never knew you were like this. And then the man looked at the woman and said, as a matter of fact, you are the worst thing that has ever happened to me in life. All because they never took time to prepare. And when some people say they are preparing for marriage, actually what they are doing, they are preparing for wedding. There's a difference between wedding and marriage. There is a day after wedding. It is called marriage. Wedding is just a matter of few hours. And no matter the elaborateness of the wedding, no matter how much you are able to shake the city, after some time, all the wedding guests will bid you bye-bye, happy married life, and they go home. And the real business of marriage begins. Whatever is your preparation will begin to speak. I've met quite a number of people getting ready for marriage. And I ask them, how prepared are you? And then they tell me, well, we have just bought the suit for the man. And we have bought the wedding gown for the woman. And we have bought some bags of rice. They are blinded by wedding. Wedding is an initiation into marriage. Wedding is not marriage. Don't mistake wedding for marriage. I once met a lady that was talking so much about her wedding. And she told me, Pastor, as a matter of fact, I'm not going to use a car on my wedding day. I'm going to use a white horse. She said, I'll be on the white horse and I will hold a white umbrella. (laughs) Praise God. Amen. And I also know that that lady doesn't know how to cook. The elaborateness of your wedding has nothing whatsoever to do with the success of your marriage. The success of your marriage thrives on how prepared you are before marriage. You don't learn how to shoot gun in the battlefront. You learn it before the battle begins. Otherwise, you become a victim. You don't prepare in marriage, you prepare for marriage. God has privileged you to be a single so that you can have adequate time to prepare yourself. As a matter of fact, the reason why it looks like there is delay in some people's 
answer to their prayer for a life partner is because God has weighed them in a balance and have discovered they are not prepared. And so He's giving them a long enough time to be prepared. And they are crying and crying and praying. I don't know when the life partner is going to come. The wise man said, when preparation meets with opportunity, results into success. There is no accidental success in marriage. Every marriage that is succeeding today was adequately prepared for. How then do I prepare for marriage? Number one, acquire knowledge. Acquire knowledge. Matthew chapter 19. Go for knowledge. When it came to success in marriage, Jesus recommended reading as the number one thing to do to enjoy success in marriage. Matthew chapter 19. And verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Have ye not read? So he expected them to have read. He listened to their question. Their question was a very stupid question. And Jesus concluded, These people have not read. If they have read, they won't be asking such a stupid question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And Jesus said, why are you asking such a stupid question? Have you not read? So Jesus, his number one prescription for success in marriage is reading. And that's why in this ministry, before your wedding day, you are expected to have read at least 15 books on marriage. Now, if you know how much you need to prepare, then you know that those 15 books are nothing. Marriage is a journey that you have never traveled before. You need to connect with people that have passed the same road to know how to go through it successfully. What you don't know, you suffer for it. I've met quite a number of people intending to get married and I've asked them, how many books have you read on marriage? Most of the time, 75% of the time, they have not read one single book about marriage. Jesus said, have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read? Why are you asking such a stupid question? Have you not read? So many get into marriage not even knowing what marriage is all about. They don't even know what they are getting into. All they know is everybody around them is getting married, so they also must get married. Some are getting set to get into marriage because their parents are putting pressure on them. Some are ready to get married because they have just graduated from the university, they have done their youth service, so the next thing is to get married. And it doesn't matter who comes, born again or not born again, it doesn't matter. To get married, God will take control. Praise God. When you read, when you study materials of marriage, you will find out what marriage is all about. You'll find out what you are getting into. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, God talking about His purpose for marriage, His original intention for marriage. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Lack of understanding of this original intention has turned so many marriages into civil war. Genesis and chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him to meet his needs. So marriage is all about meeting needs. Marriage is not about taking advantage of one another. Marriage is not about oppressing one another. 
Marriage is all about meeting needs. I will make him and help meet for him. I'll make a helper to meet his needs. There are needs, certain basic needs in a man's life that he can never meet by himself. And there are certain basic needs in a woman's life that she can never meet by herself. And so God created the marriage platform for the man to meet the woman's need and the woman to meet the man's needs. That's what marriage is all about. When you will read, you will have knowledge of the male and the female difference, the gender difference. The reason men behave the way they behave and the reason women behave the way they behave. Some married couples have come to me for counseling and when they sit down and begin to narrate their problem, you discover that the thing the man is complaining about the woman is actually the reason why God put him inside the marriage. For instance, the man is complaining that the woman talks too much. That's why you are there to listen to her. Amen. Or the woman is complaining that the man is always looking for attention. That's why you are there. Women are created with verbal power. Their power is inside their mouth. They can talk for 24 hours. It's not a vice, it's a virtue. God created them like that. Now if you are privileged to have little children, a boy and a girl, right from when they are very small, you notice the girl's mouth is sharper than that of the boy. When they grow up, it does not leave them. The thing is still with them. And you know, when you are talking and no one is listening, you become frustrated. So now because the woman must talk and because someone must listen to her, God created the man and put the man inside the marriage so that when the woman is talking, the man can listen. And when the woman is talking and talking and talking and tries to talk and the man is not listening, the woman gets frustrated and she gets into corridor gossip. Because nature abhors vacuum, she must talk to somebody. So if the man is not available, she goes to talk to somebody in the neighborhood. And one day the man will return from work and police is waiting for the man. Because the wife has said something. Hallelujah. Now that's why Peter was speaking by the Holy Ghost in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7. He said, Likewise the husband dwell with the wives according to knowledge. Giving honor unto her as unto the weaker vessel, and as being held together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Dwell with her according to knowledge. It takes knowledge to dwell together as man and wife. And because of the absence of knowledge, many couples are not dwelling together, they are simply living together. They are just like hostel mates. You wake up in the morning, the wife says, good morning, and the man answers with a nose, and then he goes his way. The only thing they share in common is the shelter over their head. They are married, but they are lonely. Because knowledge is absent. It takes knowledge to dwell together. Likewise, the husbands dwell with the wives according to knowledge. According to knowledge. Giving honor unto her as unto the weaker vessel. The word weaker vessel there does not connote inferiority. It just connotes delicateness. That she's made of a delicate material. So give honor to her. When she's talking, listen to her. Whether she's talking nonsense, talking whatever, it's not relevant. It doesn't matter. Listen to her. That's why you are there. It's part of your duty as a husband. It's part of the needs you have to meet in the life of the woman. And in case you are not ready to listen because when people talk you are disturbed, then don't get married. Because you must listen. Some very funny husbands that don't understand their wife. Their wife will be under pressure. They want to talk to the man. The man is not available. The little time he has when he returns from work, the woman is trying to talk to him. He will close his eyes and start blowing whistle. (laughs) 
God deliberately created the woman to be different from the man. And he deliberately created the man to be different from the woman. It takes knowledge for you to understand these gender differences. To know why a woman behaves the way she does. And to know why a man behaves the way he does. If you don't understand this, you will have difficulty in your marriage. Praise God. Like I said, women believe in talking because they are blessed with verbal power. And if a man wants to follow everything a woman is saying, he will soon commit murder. Because by the time a husband tells the wife, why did you prepare this soup like this? Is this how your mother taught you? The woman will say, hey, my mother. Okay, your own great-grandmother. They didn't train her well. Because she's blessed with verbal power. But on the other hand, men are people of few words. Because they are logical beings. They are not emotional beings. Women are emotional beings. Men are logical beings. They are always thinking. So they don't talk too much. They believe in action. The man is thinking of how to pay school fees, how to pay his rent, how to make investments. So he's always thinking. And because he's always thinking, he doesn't have time to talk too much. When a husband returns from work, after he had this job, he returns back and, and the wife takes the bag and he goes inside the house and the wife comes around and says, Hey, uh, honey, how was your day? The man says, Fine. News in brief. Headlines only. And the wife comes and says, I mean, how was your day now? Ah, I say, Fine now. What else? Fine. Just fine. Men believe in news in brief. They don't have time for too much details. But let the wife return from work and let the man ask her, Sweetheart, how was your day? <laughs> Amen. Amen. She will tell him, well, this kind of thing, we can't talk it while we are standing. Sit down first. <laughs> and she will begin to download everything that happened since the time she left for work. How the bus conductor insulted her. How the woman selling fish in the market told her her head was very big. And they are all important. The husband must be there listening to all of that. A loving husband, a caring husband that is out to meet the wife's knee, will place his arms around her shoulder and say, eh, so that's what happened today. Amen. But a husband that lacks knowledge of the gender difference will say, Hey, woman, you talk too much. Keep quiet. You have killed your wife for that day. Praise the Lord. So it takes knowledge. It takes assessing these materials to understand this gender difference. Now, this is the reason for so many frictions in so many marriages today. Marriage is all about meeting needs. When needs are not being met, there will be discouragement. There will be tension. There will be friction. And when it's not checked, there will be separation. He said, dwell with them according to knowledge. Give honor unto us as unto the weaker vessel. And as being great heads together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. When prayers are hindered, there's friction in the home. There's tension. But when needs are met, there's fulfillment, there's joy, there's gladness. The man is meeting the needs of the woman. The woman is meeting the needs of the man. 
There are so many husbands that do their best. They buy foodstuffs in the house. They do everything. And they still wonder why their wives are not happy. You can buy all the foodstuffs you want to buy. Buy all the clothes you want to buy. There are certain intimate needs in her life that if you are not meeting those needs, she will be depressed. It's better not to be married at all than to have a depressed wife in your house. So you need to understand this gender difference and the only way to understand it is to assess knowledge. There are so many volumes out there about family life, people with proven results in their marriage, people that have testimonies. So many materials out there that you can take advantage of and take time to prepare yourself, take time to acquaint yourself with relevant knowledge. This thing called marriage, what is it all about? What is expected of me? Praise the Lord. For instance, one of the differences between the man and the woman is that the man thinks in straight lines and the woman thinks in a grid. Several lines. And that's why a woman can start pursuing 12 things in the morning. Wake up in the morning and start pursuing 12 things at the same time. And by midday, she is frustrated. But a man will pick up one item and pursue it. By the time he's coming back in the evening, he has a result to show for it. So it's the duty of the man to find out what are the things my wife has lined up. And out of those 12 things, pick one for her. Tell her, pursue this one. You will have results at the end of the day. When a woman is happy, she can cry. When she's sad, she can cry. It's all part of her makeup as a woman. When she's happy and very, very happy, very, very excited, she will begin to cry. A man that does not understand will be wondering, are you a cry baby? Why are you always crying in this house? When things are good, you cry. When things are bad, you cry. When are you going to stop crying? <laughs> she's just being herself. Because she's an emotional being. Praise God. Women are created by God to thrive in an atmosphere of love. And God put the man in the marriage to be expressing love to her. But some people have gotten married several years. They can't even remember when last they looked at their wife eyeball to eyeball and said to her, I love you. They can't remember. And some funny men will say, well, I love her. She knows it. It's inside my heart. <laughs> if it's in your heart, it will come out through your mouth. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A woman's life begins to blossom in an atmosphere of love when the husband begins to express his love to her. A wife dresses up in the morning and comes in front of the man and spins around. And the man is wondering, why are you doing like that? She wants you to say something. She wants you to say something about her dress. No matter who has given her compliment until the husband does it, it's not enough. Don't just be dressing up in the morning. It's time for church and then your wife dresses up and she's coming in front of you and says, what are you doing? Don't you know we are almost late for church? My friend, hurry up. It's not church. You don't know what you are supposed to be doing. You are supposed to be expressing love to her. The more you express love to her, the more the potential that God has placed inside her begins to come out. The more you show her bitterness and hatred, the more the worst of her begins to come out. Just tell her you are a lioness. By the time you return from work, something else is waiting for you inside the house. The Bible says you will have whatsoever you say. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you begin to express love to your wife and say the things you want to see happening in the life of your wife, the faith she requires to become the thing you are saying is being released through the words you are speaking. Praise God. 
Likewise, ye husband, dwell with them according to knowledge. According to knowledge. It's impossible for a man and a woman to truly dwell together in unity without knowledge of the gender difference. It's impossible. There will always be friction in such home. The best they can do is to pretend. They come outside and, and be smiling like somebody carrying a bag of cement on the shoulder. And when they get inside, they begin to box themselves. Now, when you have knowledge of the gender difference, you will understand why your wife does certain things and then you'll be relaxed with her. You will understand why your husband does certain things, you'll be relaxed with him. But this knowledge won't fall on you like right, Cherish. You have to go and acquire it. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. There are volumes upon volumes. I can give you so many. In case you don't know the ones to buy, you can see me after now. I'll give you so many, so many. So many to buy. Every day new ones are coming out. I've been part of wedding some people. And after a few months, I saw them. How, how is everything now? They say, well, <laughs> the thing is getting tough. And when I check, I discovered they never read anything before that wedding. They were just carried away by emotion. Busy announcing to everybody, we are, we are getting married, the wedding bells are ringing. Praise God. Number two, preparation. Develop quality relationship with God. In Job chapter 22 and verse 21, it said, Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Develop quality relationship with God. When you have a quality relationship with God, you will not be under pressure. Irrespective of the, your age, you will not be moved by situations and circumstances. When you go home and your parents begin to tell you, everybody is getting married, when are you going to get married? Tell them, very soon I will get married. But when you are not acquainted with God, when you don't have a relationship with God, you are moved, you are tossed to and fro by situations and circumstances. When you hear that one of your classmates has gotten married, you lose concentration. But I have good news for you. No matter who is getting married around you, their own marriage cannot stop your own marriage. Because everything God created, He created to operate in their own time and season. There is a time for you and there is a season for you. It doesn't matter how many people are getting married around you. The day you get married, it will look like nobody has ever gotten married before. So when people are getting married around you, rejoice with them, celebrate with them, and tell yourself, my season is coming. My own time is coming. Someone's time cannot stop your time. But when you are not acquainted with God, when you don't have a relationship with God, you'll be under pressure. And then you begin to speak languages like, well, if, if God doesn't hurry up, anybody that comes my way now, just marry. Whether believer or unbeliever, it doesn't matter. It's better to be a single believing God to be married than to be married and praying to become a single. And I tell you the truth, there are so many people married today that are praying and wishing to become single once again. That won't be your portion. I said that will never be your portion in the name of Jesus. When you have a relationship with God and you are in an engagement and someone walks up to you, the person you are engaged with walks up to you and looks you straight in the face and says, I'm not interested in you anymore. You are, no long, you are not fine enough for me. When you have a relationship with God and such a thing happens, you will turn around and give glory to God because God is about to do a new thing in your life. But when you don't have a relationship with God and someone tells you something like that, your whole life can be shattered. I've heard of people who lost their mind because an engagement was broken. And I said, what a stupid thing to do. If you lose your mind because someone says he doesn't love you, what will you do when you find the one that loves you? And brother, let me announce to you, don't let no sister look down on you and tell you you are a short man. There are two categories of believers. You are either wonderful or you are delicate. The psalmist said, I'm wonderfully and delicately made. You are either wonderful or delicate or you are both of them. So the sister saying you are short doesn't know what she's talking about. 
Because the word short is relative. A man you call short in Nigeria, when he arrives South Korea, he becomes a very tall man. So don't let nobody look at you and tell you you are ugly. They don't know what they are talking about. And in case you are here, somebody has broken your heart and you thought that was the end of the world, a good news for you, there are about 1,000 that want to say yes for everyone that said no to you. Actually, some of the broken engagements are deliverances in disguise. What would have happened in five years' time in your marriage? God saw it ahead of time, so He delivered you from it expressly. That's what that man would have done to you after five years in the marriage. Would have kicked you out and bring in another wife. God saw it ahead of time and God delivered you before you entered the marriage. It's better to have a broken engagement than to suffer divorce. So if someone has broken your heart, refuse to allow your heart to be broken. Remember, you know, the former things here, the Lord. Neither consider the things of old. For behold, I will do a new thing. God will do a new thing in your life. I say God will do a new thing in your life. In the mighty name of Jesus. Number three. Discover God's purpose for your life. These are things that you can do readily as a single, that when you are married, because of the demands of marriage, you may not have the time for that. Discover God's purpose for your life. Because you are not a biological accident, you are here on purpose. You are here to fulfill a definite assignment. But someone has said, when you don't know where you are going to, anyone is free to direct you. So take time as a single to find out God's plan for you. Find out God's purpose for you. He said to Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God has an assignment for you. You are not a non-entity. You are not here for census. You are here for a definite purpose. You are here to fulfill destiny. Find out God's purpose for your life. And it will help you in your choice of a partner. Number four, cultivate quality character. We're talking about preparation for marriage, the things you need to be doing. Number one, acquire knowledge. Number two, develop quality relationship with God. Number three, discover your purpose. There's a reason why you are here. And number four, cultivate character. The Bible says, favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a virtuous woman who can find. It is character that sustains beauty. I don't care your outward look now. I don't care your outward beauty now. Without character, after a few times together, that beauty will turn to ugliness. The Bible says it's better to dwell in one corner of the rooftop than to live in the same house with a contentious woman, a woman that lacks character. You need character. It is character that sustains destiny. It is character that sustains beauty. It is character that will sustain your marriage. When every other thing falls apart, character will still be standing. And character doesn't fall down like ripe cherries. It has to be cultivated. Find out certain negative traces in you that are capable of destroying your marriage. For instance, if you are given to anger, if you don't do something about that anger while you are single and you get into marriage and it shows up, it's capable of destroying your marriage in one night. Very simple definition of character is God-likeness. So everything in you that is not behaving like God as a single is time to tame it. It's time to deal with it. It's time to tame it. Character is like smoke. You can't hide it. No matter how much you try to hide it, after some time, it will show up. When pressure comes, it will show up. 
So the best thing to do is not to hide it. The best thing to do is to deal with it. Deal with it. And the underlying factor of our character is control. Control. One of the fruit of the spirit is called temperance. Another word for temperance is self-control. And God gave us that fruit because we have a self that must be controlled. If you don't control it, it has the ability to go haywire and do whatever it wants to do. So learn to exercise control. Exercise control on your behavior. Exercise control on the motions of the flesh. Exercise control. You have self-control because you have a self that must be controlled. And you are the one God has put in charge to control that self. Whatever you can control has become demonic. So every character trait, every negative character trait that you don't like, you don't want, the time of being a single is the time to deal with it and tame it and bring it under control. Otherwise, a marriage is capable of showing up and in one sweep, it can bring down the marriage of many years. If there is something men don't like, men don't like people arguing with them. By the time your husband is talking, before he talks one, you have talked ten already, you are calling for trouble. Praise God. The next area we need to prepare, number five, is to take care of our outward appearance. Take care of your outward appearance. Most of the time, when a brother approaches a sister to propose marriage, and after he has proposed marriage or delivered his manifesto, and the sister goes and be praying and praying and praying, and she's not coming back, check it out very closely. Something is wrong with the outward appearance. Some people have become so heavenly minded that they are not aware at all about what is happening around them. Some don't even bother to brush their teeth anymore because of so-called spirituality. They are speaking in tongues. They will almost even greet you in tongues. Some even attempt to brush their teeth, but they don't brush their tongue, and they don't know that's where the smell is coming out from. It's all part of it. The Bible says you have been bought with a price. Glorify God with your body and with your spirit. Take time to learn about color combination. It's all part of it. Don't go and wear a red suit and a green shirt and blue tie and be looking like fireman. And then you appear before a sister to propose marriage and the sister said, the Lord has not spoken to me. As a lady also, learn color combination. It's all part of it. Don't say, well, I don't have money. No matter your level financially, there's always a place where they sell your size. If you can't go to a proper boutique, there are some other levels of boutique. It's not actually money you need. You need sense. That's what you need. Buy it and iron it very, very well and put it on and put a Holy Ghost smile on your face. And someone comes around and says, well, sister, I like your dress. Where did you buy it? You don't owe them anything to tell them where you bought it. As a lady, learn to walk like a lady. It's all part of outward appearance. Learn to walk. Don't walk like a man. Because no man wants to marry another man. Amen. Walk like a lady. Learn how to walk. Walk majestically. Bring out your femininity. When you talk, talk like a lady. Don't talk like a man. Talk like a lady. When you sit, sit down like a lady. Sit down with dignity and honor. And brother, when you iron your trouser, don't iron it like skirt. Iron it like trouser. It's all part of it.
Don't wear your shirt as a brother and be flying your collar like an area boy. And just bend your shoulder and be walking anyhow, careless. Walk with dignity and honor. When you talk, talk like a man. Talk straight. Iron your trouser very well. Let the gator be reporting. When you shine your shoe, let it be reflected. Hallelujah. When it's time to propose to the sister, you put your hand in your pocket and bring out your leg. <laughs> Amen. If your hair is getting bushy, get to the barber and cut your hair. The reason some, some sisters turn down some brothers' manifesto is because of the way they talk. They want to propose marriage, uh, sister, uh, shall we pray? It's not time for prayer, it's time to talk. Hallelujah. So take care of your outward appearance. If it's only two shirts you have, make sure they are clean, well ironed, dress smartly. Let your dressing be making a statement all the time. And then point number six, learn to be domesticated. Particularly sisters, learn to cook. There was a story of a, a, a lady who was never around when the mother was cooking. She was never available. She's an area girl. She has gone to the neighborhood and finding out what is happening. And most of the time when she comes back, she'll find the mother clapping hand over the pot. She didn't know what the mother was doing. And not too long... She ran into a very unfortunate man and they headed to an unfortunate altar and an unfortunate priest joined them together. And after a very elaborate wedding, all the wedding guests had gone home, they went back to their house and the husband said, it's time to go and cook. And the lady got into the kitchen, everything was available, but she didn't know what to do. So she packed all the ingredients and poured water in the pot and put them there and set it on fire, and was wondering, what next do I do? And she remembered the mother used to clap hand over the pot. She opened the pot and began to clap hand. And when she presented the food, your guess is as good as mine. Learn to be domesticated. To be married and your husband is eating from the booker is an insult on your personality. The way into a man's heart is through the stomach. Learn to give your husband different delicacies. By the time somebody starts cooking for your husband outside, get ready, very soon the person will collect your husband. They learn it. Go to older women and find out how do they prepare this. How do they prepare this? Learn how to do it. Not that they ask you to go and cook fried rice. When you bring it, they don't know the difference between jollof rice and fried rice. You have jammed everything together. Or you cook a goosey soup. When you bring it, all the substance has moved to one side of the plate and the water has collected to the other side. And when the man put the amala inside, it will catch the water here. Amen. Or you finish cooking, you don't even know how to present it. Carry rice and put inside the same plate, put uh, plantain inside, put chicken, put everything and carry it like a sacrifice and be bringing it.
Hallelujah. Those who know how to cook on earth, they did not bring it from heaven, they learned it here. So take time to learn it. By the time your house girl is now serving your husband food in the house, that house girl will soon take your husband from you. Take time to prepare. Some people, the only thing they know how to cook is indomie. Rise up to your feet. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands to heaven. The Bible says, Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord is God. Lord, I don't want to make a shipwreck of my marriage. I don't want to miss it in my marriage. I want my marriage to be a heaven on earth. I receive grace from you right now to begin to prepare myself. Lift up your voice and begin to call for that grace now. Every grace I require for adequate preparation to be the right partner. Lord, I receive that grace from you. Every grace I require to make the best, to make the most. Of my days as a single. I receive that grace from you right now. I receive that grace from you right now. Lift up your voice and begin to call for that grace. Call for that grace. Come against every slothfulness. Every carelessness. Every laziness. Every nonchalant attitude. Everything that wants you to be in a hurry. That does not want you to pay attention to the things that are important. Lord, I take grace from you tonight. Grace for adequate preparation. I receive grace. I will not regret over my marriage. My marriage will not fail. Lift up your voice. Somebody talking to God at all. Lift up your voice. You know the area you need preparation. Why don't you begin to call down for that grace right now? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Grace to cultivate quality character. Character that reflects Jesus in every area. Lord, I take that grace from you. Grace to acquire relevant knowledge. Grace to develop a quality relationship with God. Lord, grace to handle my outward appearance. I take it from you now. I take it from you now. Grace to be domesticated. Lord, I take it from you now. Grace for adequate preparation. Grace for every level of preparation I require to make the most of my married life. Lord, I receive that grace from you. All that marriages are failed, my own will not fail. I will not make a shipwreck of marriage. I will not regret over my marriage. My marriage will become heaven on earth. My marriage will be a reference point. I receive grace for adequate preparation. I receive inner strength. I receive courage of heart to deal with every character failure. I receive courage of heart. I receive courage of heart. I receive inner strength to deal with every character failure. I receive grace from you, O God, to open up my heart and my life before you, to allow you to touch me in every area I require your touch. O God, help me to prepare. Lord, help me to prepare to make my marriage what you have ordained it to be. Let it be Almighty God. Blessed be your name forever. For in Jesus' precious name we have prayed. The Bible says, Do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. If you are here under the sound of my voice, you are in a marital relationship with an unbeliever, you are digging your grave without knowing it. Because when you marry a child of the devil, Satan becomes your father-in-law. And your father-in-law has a right to come into the house anytime. Don't try it. It's better you are not married than to go and marry an unbeliever. You can't be wiser than God. Don't say, well, I'll marry him. Later I will get converted. You are not the Holy Ghost. So many have done it and they are still regretting. God knows what to do. He knows the right person. That is going to give you fulfillment. And it knows the right time to bring that person into your life. What God can do for you, no one can do it for you. 
In case you are here tonight, under the sound of my voice, you are in a relationship, a marital relationship with an unbeliever, and you have been struggling. You don't know what to do. Something on the inside I've been telling you. It's time to separate from this relationship. And you have carried on. Tonight is a night of decision. And I'm going to pray for